Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. The Legendino is here in Rio with us. And Tim Vickery, I know this is an opportunity today um, as we talk about a certain match in uh, January of 1988, 16th of January 1988, this is an opportunity to bring out the best of your black country because <laughs> it's Villa versus Coventry. Uh, you're going to be doing all this all night long, aren't you? No, I'm not. In in respect to the great Gary Shaw, regular listeners to the, the World Football Phone-In will know that for years now, I've been going on about what an absolutely fantastic player Gary Shaw was. Uh, and now he's left us far too young, which kind of reflects a career which ended far too young because at the age of 22, in 83, he suffered a, a, a serious knee injury. And though he tried to play on, he was, he was never the same again. But this isn't just a story of what Gary Shaw could have become. It's a story about what he was because even at the age of 22, he's a player who, it, it, it always mystified me how he was underrated. Aston Villa won the European Cup as the Champions League was known in those days in 82. Look at the goal. Look at the goal that scored. Balls played out to Gary Shaw, left side of the field, halfway line. There's not a great deal on. They've thrown him a brick and he's built a house. Because what does he do? Like an English Kenny Dalgleish, which is what he was to me, he turns the defender beautifully. A wonderfully weighted pass to Morley, the winger, and Morley squares it and Peter Witt puts it in. But it's Gary Shaw who's unlocked the defence. And just as people don't seem to remember his role in that goal, in general, they don't seem to remember how good he was, I think. Because of that trio, and Morley played for England on the wing a few games, Peter Witt played for England and I think went to the World Cup. Gary Shaw was, for me, head and shoulders. And he, he, he didn't play for England. If it had been these days where I think youth is promoted faster, I think he would have been England's leading striker in the 82 World Cup, especially with Kevin Keegan on the, on the, uh, on, on the slide. And just an, an, an example that I'm, I'm not on my own in this, Villa in the, the Super Cup, after winning the European Cup, Villa played Barcelona over two legs. Maradona wasn't, wasn't fit. He didn't play in these games. But after the game at Villa Park, little knock on the, on, the, on the Villa dressing room door, and it's Diego Maradona who's come for Gary Shaw's shirt. That's how highly the greatest rated Gary Shaw. So we've lost him far too soon, but it's an opportunity to talk about him with someone, a really special guest today, because it, it's someone who had a top-class career as a, as a centre forward through the 80s and the 90s, a great career in his, in, in his own right, but someone who would have played against Gary Shaw at his best and played with Gary Shaw when he was trying to, 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 to come back from that knee injury. So thank oh, you very much for joining us, let me guess. Gary Thompson. Let me guess. Oh, I was about to say that. I was about to guess that. <laughs> because obviously there's only one player, <clears throat> centre forward at least, who would have played with Gary Shaw and against Gary Shaw and has the same first name as Gary Shaw. Two R's. Yeah, well, oh, two R's yeah, mine. Okay, well, fair <laughs> enough. I was close. Gary Thompson, welcome to the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Do you know everything Tim said there about Gary Shaw and indeed about you, I know is genuine because he's talked. I think Tim is the main flag bearer for the talents of Gary Shaw, which to a certain extent yeah. has been forgotten, like he says. Um, what do you remember about Gary Shaw? You know, from the first moment you met, what do you remember about him? I'm, I've sort of uh, known Gary throughout most of our, our footballing careers. I heard about him as a young kid when I was at, uh, I was at Coventry, Gary's at Villa and he's coming through. And there was, there was a couple of players coming through. Mark Walters was just behind him as well. But Gary and a kid called Ivor Linton, they were the top two players in and around the Midlands. So everybody sort of knew about Gary Shaw. We're expecting the explosion. When I get to the under-21s eventually, I'll get my call up. Um, Gary gets called up into the squad. And you imagine in that squad, you've got the likes of Sammy Lee, Justin Fajanu. You've got uh, Vince Hilaire, Tommy Caton, Steve McKenzie, Gary Owen. 
we've got Paul Goddard and, and obviously Clive Allen, not forgetting him. We had some serious, serious players. And Gary came in and he, he was at home. Dave Sexton and Terry Venables was the manager and coach. And they loved what Gary had to offer. And so we, I got to know him even better then. By the time I get to Aston Villa, this is a couple of years after the Super Cup and that, Gary tells me, we, you're two, two, three years too late. The place is gone. And it was sad as a Villa fan as well to be part of what was going to be a club that was always going down. Gary was coming back from a bad injury. We played in the reserves together. I think we had one game in the first team together. But Gary Shaw, and everything Tim says is spot on. Gary Shaw is a footballer. As a man, he was a, he's a lovely fella. He had his demons, like as we all do. But as a footballer, he was different different class. I was going to say different gravy. He, he received the ball. He gets in little pockets. They talk about, as you say, the Kenny Dalglish of the time mm. as well. Gary was different. He, Brian Little, for Aston Villa fans, is the man. Brian Little gets a bad injury. And Keith Leonard got a bad injury as well around the same time. So we've lost two set of forwards. Gary gets his opportunity. He comes in and he grabs it. And the link, the link up with Peter with, I think David Geddes was there as well, but you couldn't, Gary Shaw and David Geddes never really showed. Peter with and Gary Shaw was brilliant. But Gary was bright. He knew how Withy played, not what Withy wanted. He accentuated all Withy, Withy's talents and Withy helped Gary Shaw as well. The kid could finish left foot, right foot. Not the quickest, but very, very bright. I mean, there was, in my career, there's Derek Statham, there's Kenny Sanson and Gary Shaw. People say they're football bright. They know the game. They know where to be. And Gary was one of them. And people in the under-21s, that people realised that very quickly. And obviously, I, I followed his career from then on. But I knew about him beforehand. And obviously, he became a great mate when I came to Villa. Two of those three players that you mentioned there are left-backs. Yeah. Statham and, and, and Kenny Sanson. And the full-back, obviously, the, the space in which the full-back is going is to operate, you know what it is. But yeah. Gary Shaw, he can roam all around the front line. No, he can he can be the top man, or he can come off and play it play off the, the the main striker. So that football intelligence that you talked about, that's got a, it's got a wider canvas, hasn't it? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And you say about the great players, they know where to be. They can read, pick up the rhythm of the game. They know where to get themselves in positions so they can cause problems. Gary Shaw, as you say, with the goal, the goal at, uh, in the European Cup final, Gary Shaw drops off into a little pocket. He spins. The centre, the centre half, whoever comes with him, sprays the ball out wide. He links the play, and like all of a sudden, he's, he's breaking his neck to get in the box. Withy puts the goal in. Obviously, it comes off his knee, shin, his toe, <laughs> but he puts the ball in, and they end up like we end up winning the European Cup. I watched the game. I watched the game. I was I had a couple of drinks. I was in Mallorca with the commentary team. I managed to talk some people into, into coming to watch the game. The lads they weren't having it. They left. I was in a bar with about twenty Spanish geezers. We had we watched the game. I'd had a couple, as I say. I saw the game 20 years later with Gary Shaw and Bayern Munich battered us. But then moments of class that Gary Shaw brought into the game, they ended up winning the game. That was just, that was the difference. You would have come up, I imagine, at Coventry with Danny Thomas. Yes, yes. So Danny Thomas was a fabulous little, quick little fullback. And it's another one who had mm. his career ended very early by injury. So you yeah, know, it was a sh shocking tackle from Gavin Maguire at QPR, and uh, Danny Danny doesn't bear grudges, but he was a terrible tackle from what I heard. And uh, Danny went on to become a physio, but Danny, like Gary Shaw, as you say, just getting into their pump. I think Danny had played twice for England. He went on a tour yeah. to Australia, and then that was it. And it, it's such a shame. So you, you've got a very very close knowledge of just how precarious this career is, you know, because yeah. Danny Thomas looked like he he could have been England's right back. And Gary Shaw, I think, was was he was going to be one of the greats, and then it's it's one moment, and it can be taken away from yeah. you. Very precarious. Well, as, as, as you said, you got the uh, eighty two World Cup. Keegan's got the dodgy back. I think Brookin was struggling as well, yeah. and uh, they end up like Kevin. They, they go with Kevin, and he plays. Gary's in. I think he's in the forty. Yeah, and then he just gets discarded. Now you look at Gary Shaw's career because after that, I think he, he scored twenty five goals with his Super Cup season. He got twenty five goals. He got the injury. Then it all sort of peters away and he spent the rest of the time, three, four years, trying to get back to some kind of level of, of quality that he could he could show. Now, you look at the three years after that and Gary Lineker comes to the forefront and Gary Lineker is now the man and everyone raves about Gary Lineker. They're two different types of players. But if you watch the way England would play and you imagine, you see Gary Shaw in his pomp and you imagine how England would have been by the 86 World Cup and England played Argentina and got beat. You're looking at two potentially magnificent players with Maradona on the pitch and Gary Shaw in his pomp 
had it had it not been brute, cruelly taken from him, then all of a sudden you've got a proper game on your hands. And then you put John Barnes on in the last 20 minutes and it's all off. Because uh, I really think that Gary Shaw and Lineker would have worked well together. Because Shaw, as well, Gary, you said, right. dropping yeah. into the pocket, Spinning the defender yeah. in the pass behind the line—that's that, that, you know, that, that, that's Lineker's game, isn't it? He could, he could dine, he'd yeah. dine on that all day. Well, Lineker wants to stretch defences. He wants to go in beyond all the time. So he's he's quick, he's, he's bright as well. So Gary, can, as you say, comes in off into pockets, gets on the half turn, starts to play balls, and because he could, he's had a good pass on him as well. And it's perfect tailor made for Lineker. But a bit like, um, I mean, Beardsley and Lineker had a great partnership yeah. as well. But you look, you look, at Gary Shaw. I mean, Beardsley was a wonderful footballer as well. And we're obviously unbiased because I saw Gary in them three to three years and he was absolutely magnificent. And I would always lean towards Gary Shaw, I think, as a footballer. As you say, with Gary Lineker, that would have been some partnership. Do you remember playing against him for Coventry? Yeah, I played against him for Coventry. I played against him mainly for the Albion. We played, uh, there's a bit, a massive game, the Albion fans, they still talk about it now. Um, we played him, it was, I think it was 30 January or whatever. And uh, Bill had, they were the bit, they'd won the league and all that the year before. They come to the Albion and we end up playing a game against them. We have battered them the first half and we end up just after half time, they score a goal, 1 0, Gary Shaw. And as Shaw's is running back and he knows it's all like, and as he goes back to the halfway and on, he says, Yep, done you again, boys. <laughs> and everybody's going mad, it's fuming. <laughs> anyway, as it happens, in the last 10, 15 minutes, like, I score one, Cyril, I score, sorry, I score two on the bounce and then Cyril gets one where he runs from the heart. Cyril Reed is typical, picks the ball up, spins his man on the halfway line, bang, he's gone. He goes and smashes the ball in the net. We end up winning the game 3-1. We're trying to find Shorey after the game, him and Morton. They're all gone. We can't find them. Like, but uh, that was the game. I mean, the Albion fans still talk about it now, but uh, that that just epitomised the way he was because they didn't really have a touch. He used his brains. He got into an area to score a goal, scoffed a little goal in like, but you see the quality that he scored, the goals he scored. The kid, the kid could play. I wonder sometimes because that, that the Villa side, it was it was it was a tough side when it? it was a hard side. It, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't a particularly yeah. classy side. No. What do you think he he might have done had he been in a in a kind of Liverpool of the time? If if he'd have gone to Liverpool, I think he'd, he'd would have become a world great. I mean, he he was uh, he was a fantastic footballer, and all the love he's getting now. Everybody's realising they, they're going on YouTube. They're looking at the plan. They're like, oh, people are now realising just how good the kid was. We saw him for them three years, and the, the the sad thing about it is, ten years later we're talking about it, and we we always say, imagine how good he would have been. This kid, the sky was the limit. The whole thing was opened up for him. He ended up, he was so good. He won the Young Player of the Year award or whatever, and he tells the story modestly. That he ends up. Um, I think somewhat the lead singer of the Moody Blues, they got um, a car, picked a car, got a car to pick him up, take him to the awards. He won the awards. And then after the awards, I mean, Gary did like a drink. They've ended up, uh, Gary's playing drums for the Moody Blues after, at three or four o'clock in the morning. And that was the sort of life he led. I mean, we always say things like, oh, he gave the ball a kick. Gary Shaw gave the ball a kick. He, he enjoyed his life to the fall. He had a great time. He'd met loads of stars. And the kid was a star. He looked like a star anyway. We used to call him Golden Balls because... Everything sort of works out for him. Then all of a sudden, it just suddenly stops. But yeah, if you're talking in, in what, what, what they call it, the pantheon of the world greats, Gary Shaw, had he not got his injury, I believe he would have been one of the best. When you see him interviewed at the time, I think I saw an interview with him after the Mar Maradona thing. And he, yeah. he just comes across as like bemused. You know, Diego Maradona Mar 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 wanted my shirt, as if he's bemused yeah. by it. What, 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 it. It was very, very, uh, very... He was very humble, to be fair. Like, all he ever wanted to do, I remember him telling me a story um, when we were, I think we were socialising one night, and he said about going to um, Vast Aston Villa. Now, he was one of the kids, everybody in Birmingham, everyone knew about, and they, all the clubs wanted to sign. And loads of clubs turned up at his old man's door, knocked the door, can we take Gary for a trial, blah, blah, blah. And his old man just shut the door in his face, and never even given the time of day. And I said, well, what happens if, he said, you're playing for the Villa or nobody. And I was like, well, what happens if Villa don't come? And he said, well, that's the gamble, big man. He said, I was desperate to get a chance to play. But Villa's his club, Villa's his old man's club, a bit like my dad as well. But said, my dad didn't matter. As long as someone was going to give him a couple of quid, then, then I was off. <laughs> now, for Gary, like, it, it was different. It was Villa or nothing. And like, even when he became a big star at Villa, even when the last three, four, five years or whatever, you see him, people stop him, they have photos with him, and he gives everybody five minutes at a time. A bit like Cyril Regis in that respect. Mm -hmm. He was a humble man and it was almost like he knew he won the prize by playing for the club he supported, the club he loved. And like he took the fact that he was bitter at times, but he took the fact that he didn't uh, have the career that he should have had 
And he took it quite well because most of us, and I, I put myself in that category, would have been bitching and bitching. Everybody would have heard how harsh, harsh I was done by. What was it like? I mean, the, the game where you line up with him, January of, of 88, against Ipswich in the old second division. It's his first game of the season. Yeah. What was it like it's, lining up with him at that point? Because we, we're mates and we're teammates and we're drinking buddies and all that, I wanted him to get the opportunity to show what he could do. Now, I'm no Peter with, but I put myself around and all that. But I knew how Gary wanted to play, and we played reserves a few times, so I knew how to. We knew how to link with each other. And Graham Taylor, I think he put him on the left hand side, and like uh, the one place Gary would not really want to play, right or left hand side. Like Birch on the right hand side, Gary's on the left. Behind Gary, we've got a kid called Bernie Gallagher. Bernie Gallagher's a talented footballer, can cover ground, but Gary got the ump in the game because uh, he, Graham didn't put him in a position where he could show what he was like, what he could he's do. Not quick, he's, he's not quick enough for wide, is he? Yeah, exactly. And he, he can't he, he can't cover the ground. The way Graham Taylor's teams played, you had to cover yeah. ground. And Gary wanted the, the ball to his feet. Yeah. yeah. And every, everything with Graham, it was like, get the ball from A to B as quick as possible. And you had the likes of um, Stainrod or Andy Gray or people like that were saying, well, hang on, what, what about building up? Graham was having none of that. Graham was going to play one way. And as a Villa fan, I look at this and the way the man treated, the way the man dealt with the club, it was a way to get us into prom promoted back into the Premier League as quick as possible. And so we all went with it. Gary went with it. But when he played him that game, Gary was bitter, bitterly upset about the way it was done. Uh, he played the game and I think it was just telling, telling Mark, but 10, 10 years later, 15 years later, me, me and Graham haven't, haven't spoken since um, he kicked me out of the club, as it were. Like, But in the end, we, you make, we make our peace. They have a do for uh, Villa for, uh, for Graham Taylor. So Graham Taylor comes in, but all the players, there's Sid Cowens, there's myself, they were all waiting, we're all on timetables, Graham's going to come in. And when Graham walks through, they introduce him, Graham walks through the door, and like, um, you all stand up, don't you, and clap him. And you put every, or, I mean, you can't bear grudges for too long. Bang, something happens, you move on. So Graham Taylor walks through the door, so we all get up and start clapping him, like, because he's the man who Aston Villa up. He ended up um, managing England, whatever. But Graham Taylor... As a manager, had a decent career. Graham Taylor was a decent fella. Just not many people quite enjoyed the way he played. The only one sitting down is Gary Shaw. So I'm sure sure is next to me. So I'm like, what's the with you? Get up. And he went, he had me on the bench for 16 times in that season. And I, he, let me, he let me play once. He says, there's no way I'll stand up for that man. I cannot have him. And he, that's the way he was. It, because it was a villa, because it was his opportunity, that was finished his career at Villa. Mm. He never, ever forgave him for that. If he'd been yeah. better handled... Was there still yeah. something there after the injury, or yeah. was he gone? The way uh, the way Graham Taylor played, probably not. I mean, we had before Graham. Uh, I think Graham Turner was there, Billy McNeil was there, and they would have gotten a bit more out of him there because we had the likes of Stainrod, who was a, a yeah. similar yeah. type of player, classy player. So, yeah. So we, you would have found a way to utilize Gary in a way that he didn't have to be chasing balls in behind all the time because you can only kick the ball so far before you run out of pitch. Now, Graham just went, it goes long, it goes long, it goes long. And we were like, every now and again, we've got to build up. If you've got someone like Gary Shaw, who's a jewel in amongst the... A, 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 I can't be disrespectful to my teammates, but Gary Shaw was a player. And so you've got him in amongst a load of players that want to just smash the ball as far and as long as possible. Then you find a way to utilise him. Yes, in any, many other managers would have looked at Gary Shaw, looked at him training and thought, we can do something with this kid. But Graham, to be, to be fair to Graham... <clears throat> it's, it's not like he used Villa as a stepping stone, but he, the Villa thing worked out nice for him. Bang, he's off to England. So it all worked out nice, and it didn't matter what he left in, in the wake. He wanted to be the England manager, and so he went to do that. And sure, he was kind of collateral damage, but it's such a shame. It, it, you should have, he should have been able to utilise him. Even with a team that smashes the ball long, eventually you're going to have to play in and around the penalty box. You're going to have to play. He'd have been perfect for that. I suppose there were uh, mixed feelings for you, having both played for... Villa and played for Coventry when Villa meet Coventry um, you know if you score you're not going to celebrate are you? Well it's funny you should say that because when I was uh, two, two days before I broke my leg Villa played Coventry or Coventry played Villa at Villa Park and my dad's there with his 20 mates from Longbridge and all that I've got them the tickets and that we play the game as it turns out, Alan Evans scores a goal and it's my fault. I've, as a centre forward, cross comes in. They used to do the near post corner, flick on, tap in. As it's getting flicked on, I think we're going to we're going to clear this. So I start moving off. Alan Evans comes in, there's the ball in the net. So uh, I think it's Jim Alton and all them were going to grab me around the neck. So in, in the end, 
I ended up getting the equaliser. Now, I scored a goal and obviously I've saved me bacon, as it were. So, yeah, I'm jumping about. I'm well happy. By the time I get in the dressing room, Jim Alton's got me around the neck and all that and saying, you let, let the man go for the goal and all that. But, yeah, I was playing for Coventry City at the time. Aston Villa's my club. I'm Aston Villa man, but I'm going to celebrate. A goal has to be celebrated. Of Nowadays, course. all this non-celebration, yeah. celebration. I can't have it. <laughs> Cele- well, you score a goal. We, we play to score goals to win games. Mm. Got to celebrate. All this like, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. No, I'm all, yes, yes, it's all about me. <laughs> because if you couldn't possibly celebrate when you score a goal, then it stands to reason that if you're the result of a goal going in the other end, you should jump up with joy. And you can't. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's all so 16th yeah. of January, 88, um, Villa take on Coventry. What do you remember? It's like on Ipswich. Sorry, Ipswich. I'm sorry, sorry, apologies. Ipswich, yeah. Uh, What do you remember about that game? Uh, I didn't remember too much about it and I watched it the other day. And to be fair, I was amazed the lack of pass, the lack of touches me and Shorey had in the game. The ball was smashed, but for back to front, Ipswich had more chances than us. And I'm watching it. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to figure it here somewhere. Sure, he's going to figure mm. it in somewhere. And with, with the Birchie figures a lot, because once he goes long, it comes to Birchie. Yep. Birchie's a good footballer. He play, he linked the play. I think Sure, he does one little trick where he flicks the ball around a couple of players and he's off. But McAnally was playing, Big Macca was playing with us. like, And well, I love the big man. He's, he's one of my best mates as well. Like, But he will tell you that basically he carried the whole thing. And um, it was all about him. But <laughs> sure, that time, Sure, he, sure, he sure he's played on the left-hand side. It was no good to him at all. And I was the centre-forward. Uh, but... Andy Gray was playing. Andy Gray makes the goal for Keown. Mike Keown scores a header, which, I mean, it was it was given massive applause at the time. And uh, I just I listened to it uh, yesterday when I watched the, the, the commentary and that. And um, I swear, I could I, Martin will say that he meant that goal, but I think it came off the top. I thought it was a Tobler road. I thought it was a bit business when it over the top of the game. But the next time I see him, I'll have to mention that because I, I love him. I mean, he's so shy retiring. Like, you've got to give him a stick with every, whenever you can. So you were evenly, the teams were evenly matched then. It was a tight match yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, well, we, we got to, we got relegated and uh, we, we obviously were in the second division. I was injured for um, uh, the relegation for three or four months beforehand and th- two or three months to the start of the season. Then Graham looks around, I get myself fit, I get in the team, start scoring a few goals and we start, Villa started, they couldn't win a game at home. So me and Shuri, we, we used to do, we used to train with Jim Walker in the morning and our, our, our ritual for the game is uh, Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham lads, Villa fans. We train in the morning at Bodymore Heath. We get get dressed and that, get ready for the game. We go into town, TGIs. We'd have a bit of food. And then, you know, a couple of drinks, just a, just a couple of liveners. <laughs> then we get back to Villa Park. We go and wish the lads all the best. And then we'd be in one of the boxes. And there'd be like stupid hostesses, shall we call them. And we'd be trying to chat to the hostesses while watching the game. But we watched the game and... Um, Birmingham City came down. Birmingham City beat us at Villa Park. And I've never seen grown men crumble as quickly. After that game, they couldn't win a game at home. And it went on for ages. Then all of a sudden, uh, McAnally was fit. I got fit. Shorey was in around the squad. And we started winning games. So the thing picked up. But it was an industrial type of football. I mean, sometimes it, I saw that game against Ipswich. And basically, I thought Ipswich was the better side. Um, it was industrial. And some of the bits I've seen make me wince that I was a part of. <laughs> That because it was, I mean, I am I'm no Pele. And I, I tell you, I'm an aggressive set of forward. But now I, I watched that game yesterday and I was still like, ooh. <laughs> not, my, not my cup of tea. But we got promotions, so. though. It's, it's that strange animal that English football was at the time because, you know, you look at the, the mud heap of the pitch and, yeah. and the thinking, you know, get it long into the channels. But in this, you still have some wonderful players. Like Gary yeah. Shaw, and, you, and Gary, you spent your career, and the, the strikers that you 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 played with, and I'm sure they're all delighted to have played with you, and they're all telling people I play with Gary Thompson. But you know, you played with with Cyril at West yeah. Brom, Gary Shaw there at Villa, Ian Wright at Palace. Yeah, I, I mean, when when I started, I didn't realise that I was always going to be the bridesmaid because I, I believed I was going to be the man. It was all about me. But I started with big Mickey Ferguson and Ian Wallace at Coventry. Right. Mark Haitley and myself played together nice. at Coventry. So we started there. So I'll go, this, I'll go uh, the Albion. Cyril's there. like, And Cyril was a wonderful player and a wonderful man. And he, he taught me, A, 
to be to calm down as a centre forward, to be a centre forward. He also taught me how to drink a lot, which I've got to say I thought enjoyed. Uh, went to uh, Sheffield Wednesday, played with Lee Chapman. I've ended up going from Sheffield Wednesday to Villa, where I've ended up playing with um, McAnally. I played with Andy Gray, the Scottish international, who is the loudest man in world football. Um, Aspinall was there. Um, obviously, Gary Shaw was there. Like, and so I played with them there. I went to, to, to uh, Watford, Paul Wilkinson. I've ended up going from Watford to Crystal Palace, where I meet Wrighty, Brighty, and just behind us, trying to get a game in the team. He come after I was there for six months. Was Thank Hollywood, yeah. So yeah, so everywhere I turned, there was, there was great centre forward. Les Ferdinand at QPR. QPR. Les Ferdinand as a QPR. When Jerry signs me, Jerry says, because uh, I've known Jerry since I was a kid at Coventry, and he rings me up and he wants to sign me. He says, I've got a couple of centre forwards here. He says, oh, they're all right. He says, but like, and now Jerry don't look anyone in the eyes. So Jerry's looking all over there. And, there. and I'm like, Joe, what, what are you saying? He said, well, I'm not too sure about him. Like, you know, he seems a little bit soft and that. I trained with this kid for two weeks. He plays one or well, two games he played. We had. Uh, Ferdinand, Roy Wegley, we had Bradley Allen, we had some players. And I, I went, looked at this team, I'm 30 years of age, and I'm thinking, well, this kid does everything I could do, but better. <laughs> and I, and I'm, not, I'm not sure why I'm here, but Les Ferdinand was a magnificent footballer. Mm. So I go from uh, them, I go and play, uh, I think I played the Cardiff, so I played with Nathan Blake there. He was another shy retiring lad as well. So basically, all my career, I've ended up playing with great centre forwards. And like, I, I would, I tell everybody I played with some great seven fours, and I'm sure, as he said to you, yeah. they probably say exactly, exactly the same about me. <laughs> if if, if you got to choose one from all the ones that you played with, and you can't choose yourself, oh, obviously, who would be the choice? Right. Who would you go with? I, 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 I probably it'd be Cyril or Ferdinand. But Ian Wright was such a nasty man when he played. But I, I'm, he was a lovely, lovely, bubbly fella. But Ian got things done because he was so, so aggressive and that. Um, it might be nostalgia. Um, you'd go for Cyril or, or, or Les Ferdinand because they're wonderful, wonderful footballers. But I played with so many, so many good footballers. Like It's hard to sort of pick one without offending all the others that I know I'm going to meet in the near future somewhere. So I'm, I'm sitting on the fence there. No, that's all right. And great stories, by the way. I think, you know, I'd love to hear the, uh, certainly the audio book of your career. <laughs> I think it would keep me in hysterics for a long time. Um, well, we did, uh, I, did, I did a book and people kept saying, you're going to do an audio. I like, uh, got to. They, they weren't really having it, but uh, yeah. I, uh, you got to I like to think I'm mildly amusing. Yeah, no, not least. But your memory as well. Your 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 memory, um, genuinely. Because if if, if you want to if you want to do an audio, audio book, I could voice it for you. What do you reckon? <laughs> he promised not to do that. I yeah. apologise, <laughs> Gary. Sorry. He promised. He promised. He promised. But it's funny. No one talks like that apart from people in Dudley. No one else. Talks like that. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that. It's the Lenny Henry effect on Tim Vickery. Um, but how do you remember all these small details? Like a match like this, there is a lot of you know small magical moments. If you see yeah. it, if you see it as we've all done on sort of replay on YouTube, half of what happened is so quick and everything that I, I can't remember half of it. To be frank, how do you remember it? I mean, playing in the game is a different yeah. experience. I get it's, that. It's, but... it's funny when um, when you not really a kid, as you grow up in life and that's silly things happen or things happen and just stay in your memory. And like when, obviously when Bill Howell wanted to write the book, because I've always told stories, we'd be sitting in a bar and we'd tell stories and something would remind me of a story. Oh yeah, and I'd tell stories and he'd say, write the book. And he was amazed. And sometimes some of the stories um, sort of merge into one as it were. So in the end, he had, to, he had to do the research to make sure all the stories were exactly as I said them like. But yeah, generally it all worked out. I'm just lucky in that respect that uh, I've got a decent memory. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay about most things, although if you listen to my wife, <laughs> I, I just remember what I want to remember. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> we're, all, we're all selective with that one. Exactly. What, what, one thing that, that, that's very striking about, about you is that you're a fan. Yeah. Some players, I mean, some players lose that, don't they? But you're, you're, you're a fan. I never, yeah, I, I never understood. When I was a kid, I loved, I loved football. I loved to play football. And like a lot of kids, as soon as the game was on, and there weren't a lot of football on when we were kids, but as soon as we could watch a game, we were out in the garden, we were practising, we were trying to do stuff and that. I remember Charlie George scoring a goal and lying on the yeah. floor like at, for, for the Arsenal. And we, this kid, me and my brothers, we straight out there, whack it in the goal, and that was just doing the old yeah. Charlie George. Yeah. You'd copy everything. like And like I, football, 
it just amazed me. I just found it fascinating. And even terrible, terrible games. I ended up scouting. And there'd be sometimes you'd watch a game for 15 minutes, you'd be like, this is dreadful. I've got to go. There's nothing here. But you'd stay just in case there was a little flash yeah. or something. Like, I just, I love to watch it. Um, I ended up, um, play, I, I, was, I played, well, I started as a kid. My uncle took me to Villa. And then obviously my old man took me to Villa. I was like one of them that went and saw Pele turn up at, uh, with Santos at Villa Park. Although, if you listen to anybody in Birmingham, all everybody yeah, was there. Yeah. That, that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we watched that game, and that was when, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a Villa fan. This is my club. I'm going to play for Villa and that. And luckily, I got a chance to do that. And that love never... I, I'm saying Steve Koppel, I think I've said in my book, I started losing a bit of a love for, for football. And I went to Crystal Palace, and Steve Koppel, who was slightly direct in the way he played as well at mm. times, all he said to us was, he said to one day, listen... Entertain me. Do something. He says, two touch in your own half, but in their half, entertain me. I don't want to be sitting there bored. And I sat there and thought, is he serious? Because I'd never heard anyone say that sort of right. thing. Everybody else was like, smacking the channels, getting in the box and all yeah. that. And all of a sudden, he's going, entertain me. And we come in sometimes at half time and say, you bored me, lads. Don't don't bore me. And, I, and after it, I just, I just loved it. Yeah. And it just, it just got me love back for football. And then obviously, I do, did some scouting, did a little bit of agency work. And now, like, I, I get to watch Villa most weeks and that and I get paid to watch it well I say paid loosely it's the BBC so you know it is what it is but I get to watch Aston Villa so like yeah I I love that I find the game fascinating and like me and the wife as much as we love each other and she says every now and again oh do you want to come and watch uh, one of, you know one of their movies where you can tell the blo bloke's going to end up with a girl and they're all going to end up together and like I'm not that the butler did it they'll end up together and she'll be like off to your own room so I go back to my room and I watch the football in this, in this room this is uh, it, 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 sort of, it sort of works for us like but yeah I mean I, I, I still find it fascinating now I mean I watched a bit of the Champions League last, year, last night I watched um, the Coventry Spurs game and I'm watching the Coventry Spurs game and I'm thinking they need a second goal and I'm getting upset I'm like they need a second mm -hmm. goal and then the Spurs do them like I'm and then sorry. you think about it what, why would you get carried away with it? I'm a grown man, but I, I love it. It never leaves you. I mean, you mentioned that Charlie George celebration. I remember that. Um, yeah. And it's funny. He didn't do it as a way of, you know, this is my goal celebration. He did it in the moment. You know, like today, yeah. players yeah. will score a goal and they want to just go up yeah. for joy. But then they remember, hang yeah. on, I've got my particularly... Yeah. It's all choreographed and branded. Yeah. 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 And etc. But yeah. it's funny that kids till today still copy goal celebrations. It's a really integral part of um, scoring, certainly for kids yeah. playing football when they're kids. I see kids coming onto a five-a-side pitch now and literally doing the sign of the cross, and, you know, <laughs> touching the ground, mm -hmm. doing the sign of the cross, kissing the ring on their finger. And that's yeah. when they're coming on the pitch. That's I, I remember this is about, about 20 ball. years ago. I saw this, uh, this fellow called Lazzaroni. Lazzaroni was Brazil's coach in the 1990 World yeah. Cup. And he was talking about youth coaching and he was saying the kids today, they, they want to choreograph goal celebrations. Yeah. Encourage them. Encourage them. You know, and oh. I'd never thought about it before. I'd have thought about it. Yeah, yeah, get on with the game. Get on with the game. You know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. If, if that's what connects with people, let them, let them do it. Encourage it. Yeah. Yeah. You said that um, something always triggers your memory about a match. If we talk yeah. about this match in particular, 16th January 1988, um, Villa versus Ipswich, what, what is the one moment that will trigger your recollections? During the game, I think the ball goes through three or four times in, in the video, you see, to Paul Birch. And like obviously we lost Birch as well. But his ability on the ball, his touch and ability to work an angle, play a little one-two, he was like a Sammy Lee. And he could see the picture as well and bang, he'd, he'd play it, he's off. And he did two or three things in that game. And you're like, oh, yeah, Birchie was just different class. Maka was Maka. He, could, he, was a, he was a big six-foot-two geezer who could dribble, but was quick and powerful. Mm -hmm. So Maka shows he's, the bits he's got. Andy Gray was Andy Gray, just striding up and down. I think he had a shot during the game where he got abused by everybody because it was never on. He had to go square to uh, play the ball forward at an angle. And Andy just took it at his feet. And Andy was a, a powerful man and he had a shot. And... Uh, there was me, me half, me half volley, which uh, hit the lad, and it, that was a goal. To be honest, yeah. like, do you watch it again? Yeah. Like, I, I can't believe it's not in the way of it. But uh, yeah, little, little things you look at, and you, and Spinky, Nigel Spink was a great goalkeeper, 
and he was a massive, not sure, he massively underrated. Mm. He played for England a few times, but really, Spinky was a top, top, top draw goalkeeper, and he showed in that game as well. Because nine times out of ten, we lose that game for all us smashing the ball into their area and causing them problems and throwing it at the ball in the box at every opportunity. They carved out the better opportunities. I think John Walker had a couple of a, a decent header, which uh, hit Spinky, and I think Spinky made two or three good saves as well. We, we were industrial. Almost Neanderthal in the way we played, but we got results and we got promoted. But uh, I've got to be honest, if you have for me to play, if they played that in my back garden, I'd close the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> fair you, enough. You, you had under 21 caps when you were yeah. at, at Coventry. Yeah. What stopped you going on to be a senior? Well, I played for the under 21s and it all went really well. I got a late call at my. But I got, I got caught the day I got I broke my leg. I got the England call up. I was on twenty one call up. I broke my leg. I was out of the game for a year. I came back, and uh, I ended up scoring two goals and an own goal in a League Cup semi final against West Ham. So all of a sudden, fifteen months later, oh, it's news! They called me into the squad. So I got called up into the squad. Played really well. Um, I think I scored one or two. And Adrian East scored. Um, we beat Romania. And Ron Green was England manager. England played the full side play the following night. And they, I think it was a nil-nil draw. And he said, oh, if we would have had someone like the boy Thompson, he would have caused problems and all that. And everyone's like, oh, this is it. So the season goes on. Dave Sixon comes as manager. Dave Sixon, magnificent coach, lovely fella as well. And Dave spent time breaking me, da- me game down and building up again and showing me the thing. He had me taking corners. You know, like Laurie Cunningham used to take him for Real Madrid, the outside of the boot. He said to me one day, do you take corners? No, Dave, I'm in the box. I did, gaffer, I, I scored goal. <laughs> come, and ta- look, come and take a corner. And he had me taking corners and that. And blokes, where, where we were, we we train at, um, at Highfield Road. I'm trying to say, the right and training ground. But above, at the side, there was like Matthew Ferguson. And at lunchtime, all well, they'd come out and watch us train. But they're on the hills. And they'd seen me taking corners, trying to bend it with me boot, the outside of me boot and that. And they were going, he's effing hopeless. You can't have him doing that. But Dave was brilliant. Dave was like, let's try this side. Let's go. They want a good idea. Dave was magnificent, right? So, yeah, I just, I forgot the question now. I've, I've been wrapping this so long. About right? your England under 21 career. Oh, yeah. So, it looked like I was going to get a chance. Then, all of a sudden, I went to West Brom and uh, me and Cyril had it off. We were scoring goals. We were playing really well. And uh, it was just before Christmas. So Chrissy Waddle plays for Newcastle and Gary, Gary Bannister. Gary Bannister was a kid at Coventry with me. And then Chrissy was a kid at Coventry, but they didn't take him on. So we play Newcastle and um, at the Hawthorns. And Bannister pulls us before the game. So the three of us were in a huddle. And they go, right then, word on the street is, one of us is going to get called up for the full side. One of us is going to get called up for the B side. And that's it, like, really. So, be the shy, modest man I am, I'm saying, well, you two better sort that B-side out. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, the uh, <laughs> banished to play for the B, Waddle, Waddle was, became Chrissy Waddle. And, uh, yeah, I was still waiting for the call. Because yeah. I've not retired Yeah, yet. one of these days. One of these days. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, were you the tasty geezer? Because I understand that Graham Taylor didn't like the fact that you had a little bit of a line in, you know, shaft style leather clothing well, when you're a kid you grow up and they call them black black exploitation movies like yeah, yeah. but john shaft was the man he was you know, the black man used to be yeah, dressed yeah. you dress proper Any anyway person. so like, if you, there's there's a video not a video there's a thing on shoots there's a picture of me and tom english and we we're in our our rude boy suits with a pork pie hat and all that mm. and everybody now rubbishes me for that but we 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 kids, we're 19, Style 20, we've got a couple of quid in our pocket. We have gear. We had we had proper gear. So yeah, I turn to the villa. Graham Taylor gets the manager's job and um he comes in the, the day, he gets the job, Doug, Doug introduces him, walks in. We're sitting here, I've been injured, so I'm just minding my own business. He comes in and he rubbishes people in the room. Paul Elliott, um Tony Dorigo, he slaughters people. Have you give your best Raston Villa? You've got to move lined up, blah, blah, blah. So me and Shaw is sitting there and to see beyond because we're all Villa fans, sitting there giggling. He's letting them know fair play to him. Like. Anyway, he, he didn't even look at me. He just went, are you? He says, you, you're a centre forward. They spent 400 grand on you. You don't score no goals. You're always injured. You get more bookings than injuries. Like, in fact, well, you're no good to me. Get out. And I was like, <laughs> so, yeah. And I, but I know he's trying to make a point. So I'm like, fair yeah. enough. So I go out of the room. I wait. The lads come to the car park. We have a laugh about it. And move on. Next day, I drive into training. Go into training. As I drive in, I go into the car park. I can see Bobby Downs. 
Steve Hunt, Steve, uh, Bobby Downs, uh, Graham Taylor, and um, Steve Harrison. Steve Harrison. Yeah. That's it. So, so yeah, Steve Harrison. Steve Harrison. So Steve Harrison. Uh, so I see him. They're all suited and booted. So I pull up. If you imagine where you are, is the way into the, the, the dressing rooms and all that. And I next on the, on the other side, right hand side, is the, the actual pitches. So I uh, car parks here. So I pull up in the car park nearest the pitches. So I get out of the car, know something's up. And as I start walking, Aspinall comes towards me. He puts his head down. He goes, good luck. Gets in the car, drives off. <laughs> so I walk out towards the pitches. As you do, pick up a bit of grass. Something I've never done before. Throw it in the air. I'm checking the temperature, the wind of it. So I'm trying to come around the back of him. Like, as I get to the door, and they're watching me, and they know what they're doing. Get me hand on the door. He says, uh, can I ask you a question? So I went, uh, yeah. He says, uh, where do you live? I says, Bassett's Pole. Says, Describe your house. I said, well, five bedrooms, you know, I've got sauna, got the foundation dug out for a swimming pool, got a third of an acre, blah, 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 got study and all that. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, he says, look, that's all well and good. He says, um, what do you think your neighbours think when they see you in the morning? I says, well, they probably think there's Tom off the training. And he went, no, they think there's that scruffy black. And he, he said another word, like, so he, he says, uh, they probably want, want a scruff bag. He says, like, you come into work, he says, so you come in slacks and shirt, or you come in a tracksuit, you are coming here to a place, to a place of work. Get yourself off. And I went, as you would do, this gear costs more than you three, all your gear put together. Like, I said, I'm looking sharp. And he went, uh, you look like the Black Funds. Get yourself off, get yourself home. I had a black t- black leather jacket on, white T-shirt, blue jeans, and uh, white trainers, no socks. Because that was all. That was a Miami Vice thing at the time. Like. And, uh, he said, "Get yourself home." So I was with, like, with you all "Yeah, the, I've got it, Gaffer." With you all the yeah. way on that one. Yeah, <laughs> That's it, yeah. So get yourself home. Jumped in the car, went back to the house. Mrs. killed herself laughing. He's gonna really sort you like that. And uh, that was the start of it. We had to wash our own kiss, clean our own boots, because apparently we'd become such big time stars, we forgot what it was like to connect with football. So we had to basically be back, be, like the apprentices, all over again. So wherever I was that season, I'd walk around with a massive bag. When, when the wife threw me out, as, as she was prone to do at the time, uh, I'd stay at my mum and dad's, but I'd have this bag. And my dad would be like, I'd get me bag. I'd have me dinner with mum and dad. So now it's about five, six o'clock. I'm going to meet the lads. We're going to go for a few beers. And who knows what will happen. And uh, my dad would be like, where are you going? I'd say, well, you know, dad, I'm just going to go and have a couple of beers, watch your game with the lads. And, you know, you know I'll be back in a bit. He said, he said uh, you got a game Saturday. Yeah, it's Monday. You got a game Saturday. <laughs> Sit down with me, boy. You're, you're not going out. So that was it. I was, I was, I was 26 years of age. You could get out. <laughs> yeah, it's your dad's house. It's your dad's rules. Uh, you got to live by them. Yeah. Do, do you think that, exactly. do you think that Unai Emery could get away with similar tactics with, uh, with today's Villa squad? Nowadays, Unai, I mean, I was, I was just talking to you. David James told me a story that Apparently, Unai, because he had, does all the videos and does all these bits and bobs with players, and he's very, very intense. But I think for two, three, four years, it might work. But in England, after a bit, players do have a concentration span of a flea. But uh, Unai was doing had some videos, and he sent players videos. Anyway, sent the videos to this one lad, and he said, oh, you've seen the video? And Yes, Gaffer. Yeah, I've got, I've got it in my head now. So when we train him, we, we'll have it. We'll have it off like... And apparently there was nothing on the video. And then I was just sending it out to check to check the video. <laughs> so like, I think that he's, these people are very sharp nowadays. They they won't let no stone unturned. And fair play, talking about you and I, he has done an absolutely magnificent job at Aston Villa at the minute. This, this, we look like a football club mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. the fellas mm-hmm. are magnificent. He's been absolutely super. Mm-hmm. You don't look like losing, but anyway, that's another story. Going back to 1988, we know now that you were a dedicated follower of fashion that means you were probably a dedicated follower of music and we always look at the soundtrack to the games that we talk yeah. about here on the right. brazilian shirt name podcast so I'm what, what did you grow up with what, what what was what was the music of your youth gary when i was a kid um it was uh, my dad loved elvis my dad loved elvis and basically any blues reggae and, and any, my house my house, i am your house dad. Was always put, yeah, there was always there was always music playing, like a bit of reggae. There was always something going on. There was always people there. It was it was like it was always noisy. It was it was nice, but there was always music on. But my dad, every now and again, when he was in his mellow moments, he'd have a bit of Jim Reeves on or a bit of Elvis, and I, that's why I ended up loving Elvis. Mm. I joined I joined Coventry, and they they listened to things like Steely Dan and all that, and I, I couldn't really 
get to grips with it. And they, no, no, this is this and big man. And I'm like, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. yeah that's so I, 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 I listened to bits, but mate, basically it was uh, the OJs and the sound of Philadelphia because that was hip at the time. Mm. Like, And I was right into all of that. And then uh, I think there was a time when uh, Bootsiller and all them came in and I started listening to a bit of that. But I, I got dragged to a concert once and it changed my life musically because I'd never really listened to anything other than blues and soul and reggae and that. And I got dragged to a concert with um, there's Mark Aitman's girlfriend, my my girlfriend at the time, and uh, Danny Thomas and a couple of others. And we end up sitting on the, these seats. Danny's in someone else's seat. He nearly kicks off. So I say to the geezer politely, um, okay, I'm sorry we're in your, your seat and that, but if there's any more trouble, I will knock you out. <laughs> so basically, you know, it got sorted out. Anyway, I'm sitting there. I end up sitting to the same geezer. So I think there could be a problem here because he might clump me and I can't see him. So Mark, look it. Anyway, the stage goes black. There's a guy, there's a white light, this guy's in the middle of the, the stage light, and he's, uh, he's, a, he's got a bass guitar, Phil Linnett. Mm. So I, I look at this guy, and he starts playing the guitar, and the Tin Lizzy played, and I was like, damn, that, it was just different, so powerful, so energetic. So I, I was into a bit of Thin Lizzy, from then on, I had a bit of that. Then I started listening to all sorts, of, and, and uh, obviously the Scar Revolution happened then as well, and we was all into that, we ordered all the gear, and uh, even... Tom English and all them became new romantics. I couldn't go that far, but uh, I, I did listen to the jam and things like that around that time. I, I listened to a lot of that. And over the years, I just listened to absolutely everything now. Like I, this, When I was a kid, I could only listen to certain music and I'd be like, I'm not having that. But Phil Linnett and Thin Lizzy opened my eyes that there was other music out there. And I, now I listen to absolutely everything. I got into, into uh, with Mac and Ali at Villa, it was uh, the rap, rap in that age was a big thing, like, and uh, Big Daddy Cool and all. We was into all of that as well. And basically, I listen to anything nowadays. I mean, my daughter listens to stuff now, and I sound like my dad now. And I, what's this? I don't understand it. What, 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 what words? There's no words to it. All that. And I, then I can hear myself, and I say, you're like the old man. But, yeah, most mostly music. If it's got a decent tune, I'm, I'm into it. So I listen to most anything. So, so what was the tune around that time, around well, that game? Well, I was saying, uh, 16th of January, 1988, the number one yeah. tune was Belinda Carlisle um, with Heaven is a Place on Earth. Do you remember that? I remember the tune, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm cringing a little bit because it's not... I, I listen to most things, but Belinda Carlisle was... That, that was kind of a lover's... That, that was kind of a... There's nothing oh, no, wrong with no. lovers. Nothing wrong with yeah, lovers. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't mind a bit of loving, yeah, but yeah. yeah, yeah. A, bit um, a bit syrupy for me, that. There is a problem with all these tunes that will be a repetitive theme, I don't doubt, as we go through the charts, which was that in the 1980s, they had a particularly um, not pleasant drum sound that was the in vogue thing at the time. That but when big drum sound, the, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It sounds a little bit industrial, it sounds a little bit tinny as well compared mm. to the real sound, um, the organic sound of a drum. And that is, for me, I think it's a great song, by the way. I don't know what you think, Tim, but for me, that's the um, failing of Heaven is a Place on Earth. It's got that 80s uh, drum sound about it that you can only take so much of nowadays. Uh, that's at number one. And number two, always on my mind, the Pet Shop Boys cover of an Elvis tune. What would your dad think of that? It, oh, I lost my arm a couple of years ago, but he, t he would turn in his grave. I could imagine at the time hearing it being like that. And black people can suck their teeth. My arm would suck his teeth and that. He'd be like... Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't think he'd be having that. No. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. Um, well... Uh, my, my missus toured with the Pet Shop Boys for years and years and years. And yeah. she tells a story about, you know, Lee Ting and Neil Tennant. He was a choir boy at school, but he always had a very thin voice. And that's why he brought in a lover's rock singer like my missus to shadow him and to boost up his voice just a little bit. So yeah. I feel a bit bad for them because... Um, you know, they get a lot of criticism from real, pure music fans, not least for the singing. But they had their shortcomings, but they also had their insecurities. Kind of like what you were saying about, you know, footballers. If you're sitting there waiting to get a chance to uh, get on the pitch, by the time you get on the pitch, you're probably quite knackered from waiting or whatever. He had his insecurities like a lot of people. and um, But he brought yeah. the tune back. 
He brought the tune back because I think people there, there, there's a number of like pointless covers in this chart. This is one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the the Stranglers doing all day and all of the night. Just pointless. And I love the I love the Stranglers cover yeah. of Walk On By a few years yeah, earlier because they they, they do one, something yeah. totally yeah. different with it. They take it off to a different space. But all day and all of the night, I yeah. can't really see the point. There's one, but I mean, there you, some... you, you mentioned Good. the rat thing and that, that's starting to come in. I didn't get into it until the next year. I got into, I remember when Do The Right Thing came out in, in 89. Yeah, yeah. And that, that yeah. opened the door to uh, yeah, Public yeah. Enemy for, for me. Fighting the power. Yeah. But there's. Yeah, Public, so, oh, public Enemy. Public Enemy. Yeah. You know, so the rat thing is starting to come in. And us being English, yeah. what are we doing? We're already taking a piss out of it. Tony Hawks, Morris and the Miners, the stutter I know, I know, I know. It goes around my head all the time. No sleep till bedtime. Yeah, I blame it on the Beastie Boys. I blame it on the Beastie Boys. So it started with the Beastie Boys, which initially, if you're into rap from the days of Sugar Hill Gang, and um, I think you mentioned Big Daddy Kane, who I managed to see live in an interview as well, um, Public Enemy, etc. Then suddenly the Beastie Boys come out and you think, what the F is this? And yeah. it sounded like a piss take to start off with. It's only the fact that they, they were on Def Jam Records, which made you think, okay, somebody oh. at Def Jam, which had given us all these great artists like Public Enemy and so on, somebody thought that they were worth recording and there's something yeah. in it. And they appealed to a different demographic. The Tony Hawk's one, Morris Mine. I remember when that came out. I remember the cover. That's how distinct this nonsense it's, was it's, in my it's mind. It's the great it's, English thing for taking a piss like when yeah, when, when, right. when the thing was right. first invented you get captain sensible doing what remember that yeah yeah oh, yeah, yeah 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 we're, we're just fabulous at taking a piss out of things but at Our the same time support. at the same time we're creating a lot of stuff look at number three that tune house arrest that was the very first house record to get into the charts. House was something that we'd heard about from over here. We knew it was from Ooh. Chicago. You go to a, a club and they play one or two classic um, house artists from Chicago. I can't remember any off the top of my head. Farley, Jack Master Funk, maybe. Um, there was, um, I can see all their faces. because so I've interviewed them at DJ International once upon a time, but I can't remember them all. Joe Smooth and people like that coming out. But House Arrest, Crush, because at the beginning, uh, house did not have a distinct uh, framework. House was right. just a label that was um, given to music that was played at a certain club in Chicago. And it was dance right. music, but it didn't have a distinct kind of um, reference. And what House Arrest did, and I think, I, if memory serves me right, they are a band from the Midlands. Maybe they're from Nottingham, I think. I think they're from Nottingham. Oh. But what they've done is do the sort of cut and paste aspect of house music, yeah. which we threw into the mix. It wasn't there before. When you right. hear like Mars pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump mm. up, this is the originator of it from House Arrest Crush. People have forgotten them. They were yeah, like no two idea. or three yeah. guys. There were two or three guys um, mixed uh, heritage. You know, there were white and black guys together in the band. And yeah. they, they have created something. There was a one-hit wonder for them. I think they got as high as number two. They might have got to number one. I think they got as high as number two. And uh, it says here, Peaks at number three. But I think they went up. It's number three with the bullets. So I think they might have gone to number two, maybe number one. But people forget them because they were the pioneers of that cut and mix style. I didn't, didn't even power. know they were English. I'm going to have to go back yeah, and, and, no, and revisit yeah, this. They are. But and talk, not, talking, about, talking about multiracial from the Midlands, What's your view, Gary, on you, on UB40? That, when I was a kid, they were the band. Everybody loved them. And a load of, saying, uh, like white people wanted to be in and around the specials. And, um, it was, there was a good feel about the thing. Like, I mean, how can I put it? With the, with the falling out, and it all became very bitter. And Tom Very. Ross, who is a what's it in the, in the Midlands, like Tom Ross knows them, and he, he says little things every now and again. But it, it's, it's got to the point where you can't believe that they could be that much antagonism between the group and that. You know, um, as a group, you're trying to make something of yourself. You're trying to be, you know, become famous. You you get want your music out there, but all of a sudden the thing imploded. Like, and it, it, it was such a shame because they did 
for a while, they they were they were not just rocking it. They were they, they were the band. Yeah, the it was the antagonism was between essentially the two brothers, Ali and Robin. Yeah. And when you have sibling, as we know with the Gallagher's, it's a different kind of thing. Yeah. Nevertheless, as we know with the Gallagher's, yeah. that runs deep, doesn't it? When you fall out with your brothers publicly, it's hard to come back from that. You know, it's hard. You you say things at the moment that you might regret afterwards, but you can't take back. Um, I but saw family, thing- you fall out anyway. I mean, you fall out. I fall out with my, we used to fall out with my brothers and uh, we, we all fall out with people, but men get over it. You, you, you make your peace and you move on, don't you? It's the public. I know it's easy yeah. for me to say, but mm. yeah. no, no, no. You fall out with your brothers and that's fine. But if, if it's not headline news, you can sort of yeah. recover from that. You know, yeah. I, I fell out with my brother when I asked him, my older brother, when I asked him, how can you, as somebody who grew up in Tottenham, be a Manchester United season hole, ticket holder? <laughs> the guy didn't speak to me for three years. It doesn't surprise me, though. <laughs> there's, there's, a lot of London, there's a lot of London people who seem to like Man United, which is strange for me. I, it was strange for me. And that's my brother. And all I asked was an explanation. But yeah. it was I asked the explanation in a family gathering. And maybe I should have oh, asked right. the explanation... Mm-hmm. Um, out around the, around the corner, and I get why my brother's upset, and it took three years. Did, did you have that tone when you asked him? You know the tone. Yeah, it was a wind up. Yeah, yeah. 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 You, you were mocking. Yeah. You were buddy. Yeah. You were looking for a wind you, you could hear it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was you could hear it there as well. I was <laughs> suggesting that he didn't know anything about football <laughs> and supporting a football team. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I forgot about it. the great tune in the top ten. I think this is an interesting chart. You know, the greatest tune in the top ten. It's got. Terence Trent Derby's Sign Your Name at number eight, which oh. is a great track as well. He was Terence Trent was quality. Was quality. Was. On this first I mean, he, album. He only had quite albums, didn't he? Well, but he was, he was by his second quality. album, he said he was bigger than the Beatles or something like that. You know, typical quote that you don't <laughs> want to do, particularly when you're not going to do the same thing, the same thing yeah. that people loved on your first album. You decide, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a rock star on my second album rather than uh, be a sort of a bubblegum soul star, you know? Yeah. And But Sign Your Name, classic tune. Uh, number nine, Come Into My Life. Oh, Joyce, Joyce Sims. Sims. That was a soundtrack oh, my time for me. That yeah, was a tune, yeah. This That's is the, the, I interviewed her, face to face with her. In the studio was an old battered piano. And then I just thought, let me ask you, Joyce, because this tune for me, whenever I hear it, it reminds me of going to New York to see a friend of mine, Ron McBee, and we were in an old sort of bodega somewhere in, um, I think, like the village or something like that. And I was looking for something to buy, and he and his girlfriend, who was this wild girl from Detroit, who knew how to drive from about the age of eight, because everybody in Detroit oh. drives cars from about the age of eight, um, they just started dancing down the aisle um, when they found the album. In those days, you know, some of these supermarkets, bodegas would have a few yeah. albums. They pulled the album out, or maybe it was a 12-inch, out of this thing. And then they just started singing together and dancing in a public bodega. Other people, they are just like, come into my life, I got so much love. Well, you don't want to hear me singing. No. No. But Joy Sims was such a beautiful woman. Yeah, yeah, such a beautiful woman. She sat at the piano and did it for me a cappella. She was amazing. Ooh. She's late now. It was so sad when she passed. Um, mm. Relatively young woman, um, about, you know, late 50s or something like that, and she passed away. But I think that song is going to be around for a long, long, it, long, it, long time. It reminds me so much of that time. If I shut my eyes and listen to that, I'm transported back to, because it yeah. seemed to be everywhere yeah. around the time. Now, I'm, I'm told yeah. that, that, that Gary Shaw was into his music. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gary Gary loved his music. Obviously, I told you the Moody Blues story. There's been there's loads of different things like that. Um, apparently, well, apparently we were having a drink one night at the we had the Norwegian supporters do. They came over and me and Shaw went to the do. We were having a drink, lounging after, and they're they're plying us with loads of alcohol. And he says, uh, "You know, he loves me, don't you?" He calls me the footballer. I'm like, "Who's that name?" <laughs> Van Morrison. Oh, I'm like, but, yeah. what? Oh. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. He says that Van Morrison. Loved him. He's apparently, I, can't, I think he was in America somewhere. And he reckons, also, he was in, uh, what's it called? Um, George Michael in Wham. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Wham's um, the Hotel, Hotel Tropicana. 
he's on the vid show. He's sure he's in the video. <laughs> he's telling, and I'm like, I've never seen you on that. Yeah. Goes, no, no, I'm on the video. He's just obviously, he was wherever, LA or whatever. And uh, they obviously realised he was a footballer and they got him involved in it. And he says, I'm at the, at the bar with the near Pepsi or Shirley or whatever. He starts, starts, starts talking about it. And we were like, behave. But the Van Morrison one, he told me one night and uh, we'd had, it was about two in the morning with a few drinks. And next day I thought, and I'm like, I'm not having it. So I ring him now. I says, uh, so this geezer then, did he just go get out of the way or what? That's how he spoke to you then. No, no, he said like, I'm not going and doing my thing. He reckons he's in the, he's in, he's the backing vocals on the Sun tune. And he meant, I'm not doing it till the footballer comes. Where's the footballer? Where's the footballer? And that's what he kept saying. And I'm like, I'm not having it. But a couple of his mates have, have said that's the case. Where's the footballer? Where's the footballer? <laughs> <laughs> like he, he, he went to see um, Maxi Priest on the night that he uh, it didn't pass, but the night he fell over, right. he went to see Maxi Priest. Um, got his, um, his mates got him a taxi back apparently, and then obviously he had the fall. But uh, the the one thing that I think, well, at least he was he was doing something that on the mm. night he, that he loved. Like he's, he's had a few drinks, he's done what he's done, like, and um, he's he's listened to Maxi Priest. He's I got think, home. That, that, I that'll be a lovely is... soundtrack to my last night on earth. You know, going, going to well, see Maxi yeah. Maxi Priest. And, and Maxi, uh, who I know quite well, would be delighted to hear that as well. Yeah. There is there is a story to be told about why the Midlands loves reggae, perhaps more than any other uh, particular city or town in the UK. And UB40 will be prominent there. But I think the story goes back uh, to the days of, I can't remember the club that was in the bull ring, but also, you know, going back to the likes of Steel Pulse coming out of Handsworth. Oh, Steel Pulse, yeah. yeah. But th there were a lot of British reggae came out of, uh, a lot of British reggae yeah. came out of Birmingham. Look, I, I don't want to lose out on this chart because I think it's an amazing chart, but I would love to hear what you both think. And number 13, this young girl out of America broke this tune, I Think We're Alone Now, which of course was a cover. Uh, Tim, this one's not a pointless cover. She broke it. It's not a brilliant cover, but it's not a pointless cover. She broke it by going to sing at malls, you know, at shopping malls. Yeah, mall. she was one of the first malls in the United States. States. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and probably one of the last ones as well. And then this is a pointless cover. This is an interesting, at number 14, Rick Astley, When I Fall in Love. This is one that your old man would not have appreciated, uh, given that no. the original, they've had to re-release the original to show how great a song it really is, by Nat King Cole's at number 27. Yeah. And your old man was say, Nat King Cole, that's his song, exactly. not Rick yeah. Astley. Um, well, but right. Rick Astley was being managed by Stock Aiken and Waterman. They told him to do it. Sunita's GTO, probably the best thing she's done, but and that's not saying much. At number 16, the sexiest song you will hear by Michael Jackson is The Way You Make Me Feel. That song is so sexy, it should have been banned. I'm shocked that the BBC allowed that to be played. The way you make me feel. There are some things that are filth. And that is a monk them. <laughs> but you can't help dancing to filth, especially when you've got a partner to dance with. Um, and that's at number 16, like I say. At number yeah. 19, Fairy Tale of New York, The Pogues featuring Kirsty McCoy. Oh, this chart gets better and better and better, doesn't it? So, talking of, of the, the sex, the, the fellow who was Mr. R&B sex at the time was Alexander O'Neill. Yeah. Alexander. Who's, who's yeah. in the charts yeah. we criticise. I think there's a yeah. few months before, I think it's magnificent, Thank uh, uh, thank you for a good year, Alexander O'Neill. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the song because it wasn't a massive hit, but it's no, brilliant. Because no. like Alexander no, O'Neill, he's, he's you know the the, the 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 he's almost like popping out of his suit, you know, and he, yeah, he's, yeah, he's Mister yeah. Macho. And hang on a minute, he's singing about a bloke. What's going on here? <laughs> and then they kind of as it pulls back, it's a gospel song, so it's taking it back to its roots. You know, and then the gospel right. choir comes in, and what he's doing is he's thanking God for a good year. You know, mm -hmm. so it starts oh, off, and you oh. think it's a love song, and then yeah. you know they gospel it up, and you realise it, 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 it's a religious song, and it's beautifully done. It's my favourite thing of Alexander O'Neill. Thank you for a good year. I think it's it's the it's the cherry on top of his career for me. Yeah, and, on that. and this is the chart that introduces us to a new group um, of a set of twins and a third guy that nobody remembers called Craig. And they were bros with, when will I, will I be famous? 
And everybody thought this was going to be the greatest boy band of all time because they pretty much shot to number one after this week and just kept staying there, whatever they released. Of course, yeah. who remembers them now? Um, another pointless release every time we say goodbye by Simply Red is at number 40. Go on, Tim. I know you want to. No, not really. Um, it, it, another it, point it introduced people to the song perhaps but it, it ain't another, go on another pointless cover by george harrison got my mind set oh, on you dreadful you you think well, how, how can someone who wasn't yeah, so yeah. good just be so lame yeah. what was he thinking of just phoning it in isn't it? just phoning it in yeah, yeah. that's, well, that's what it. Just, that's yeah. it yeah. We'll make, a, we'll make a few quid off that. Just do that. Like. Exactly. Exactly. And this is why this chart is so interesting. Because you want to say it's a great chart. It's brilliant stuff in it. But I think it's fair to say there's a lot of shit in it that should never have made it. <laughs> I was only being polite. Thankfully, at number 60, your old man will be pleased. It's Elvis Presley stuck on you. Re-release, obviously. <laughs> Um, and when you look at, I mean, never going to give you up by Barry White's in there, number 63, it's a new entry and you're thinking, well, that's going to stay with us forever. Is it a pointless release? Never can say goodbye to the communards. I don't think so. No, Go it's on. not. No, no. It's not a pointless one, is it? Because they put, they put their own, their own spin on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they've done something to it. Um, do you remember that this was the soundtrack of the time yourself? Um, Gary, do you, do you remember when you played that match, um, uh, one nil to the Villa? Do you remember that the music of the time was as not just contentious, but as exhilarating as we've been suggesting it is? No, I mean, because we were so busy playing football and listen, we'd, we'd all, always have music on before you went to play, uh, before you went out. And obviously straight after the game, also managers said his bitch. So you'd be listening to different stuff all the time. Then obviously you would end up going drinking, you'd be in clubs or whatever. And there was always music blaring out. Like, But uh, I, until I've just heard the chart then, I, you know, just, I didn't realise there were so many bland or average tunes. Yeah. Obviously there's always good ones in there as well. But you sort of, you sort of drift by, you know, you, you hear all this. And I suppose you just knock it out of your mind like at the time you crack on what you're doing. But a lot, there's not many of them you'd have gone, oh, yeah, let's just throw a shape to that like. And as you say, me old man would be like, ah, what am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> going to have to teach me how to do that through the teeth. Well, it, it, with, with me, yeah. uh, maybe it's different for people of direct African heritage, but with me, it was always my stepmom that did the sucking of the teeth, you know. Oh. My father found it a little bit uncouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way he rolled. But there you go. Yeah. And number 96, where the streets have no name you too what a classic that is that's, that's and, true. You, you too, and it, it's on its way down obviously at number 100 straight into the charts is don't you forget about me simple minds but it's it's second week in the charts and its peak is 100 so basically they just kept it in the somebody at the you know and i'm not saying that they're dishonest or whatever <laughs> but somebody at the charts thing have thought Hang on, that tune deserves to be somewhere in the charts. Maybe let's just make sure it's at number one. Are you accusing this game of being rigged? I wouldn't dream of it, mate. I wouldn't dream of it. I just think <laughs> that sometimes serendipity and good fortune uh, collide and it ends up with Simple Mind staying. How can you stay at number 100 for two weeks with a yeah, yeah. song like, don't you forget about me? You're either, it's either going to go up or it's going to go down. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, anyway. maybe they just forgot about it. Yeah, very good point. You see, that's why he gets paid the big bucks. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, you remember when we, before we came on air, you were talking to me about how much I was owed financially. Tim never has that problem. In fact, they pay him in advance compared to me. <laughs> oh, well, I might have to insist on that. You've, you've given me an yeah. idea there. <laughs> yeah, good idea. It's been an absolute pleasure, you know, yeah, having yeah. you I'm on. Enjoyed it, guys. Oh, I'm really enjoyed it. We've you. got to do it again anytime you want. And, uh, Bring it all back, because I think listeners will love this. Gary Thompson, thank you very much. What was the name of your book again, by the way? Can we still get hold of it? It's, it's called it's called Don't Believe a Word, which is homage to Phil in it. And also, when I'm telling stories, my wife, who's heard most of them, goes, don't believe a word, he says. <laughs> so that's that's what it's all about. But can, it's, uh, you, you, it's, it's, my, it's my book, and hopefully anyone buys it, they enjoy it. So that's Don't Believe a Word from Gary Thompson. But do Gary believe Thompson, every yeah. word that Gary Thompson says about how great Gary Shaw was because he was a magnificent oh, footballer yes, yes, yes. and we've lost him way too soon. 
Yeah, and that's the reason why I've been talking. And I really appreciate your time on this one as well, Gary. It's um, it's opened my eyes and ears up to the brilliance of Gary Shaw. Now I feel like I am like uh, Diego Maradona. I want his shirt. Um, but that's the only similarity between me and Diego Maradona. We've been talking about the match, Villa versus Ipswich, 16th of January, 1988. Brilliant tribute, guys. Thank you.